Hey everyone, uh, it's been about four months since I bought the new MacBook Pro. My version is the 14 inch fully specced uh, Apple M1 Max chip with 64 gigabytes of RAM and eight terabytes of hard drive. I highly recommend you go back and look at my review from November 5th after having, I guess I had the computer for about a month at that point, maybe three weeks. Uh, I wrote an actual article, uh, there's no video for it, uh, just outlining my thoughts about the build quality, first impressions with speed, battery life. So I guess at the time that I wrote that review, I had edited three full client weddings and three full client sessions. So since writing that review, I've done substantially more work on this machine. Uh, so I just wanted to follow up with some thoughts, not only about where I think my money was best spent with this, but some of the random pieces of software and tools that I use to keep things running really fast, no matter what. If you don't wanna watch this entire video, Totally fine. I think I can sum up my thoughts uh, real quickly for you in that this is by far the best money I have ever spent on a computer. There's no doubt in my mind, this is my absolute favorite computer I've ever owned that Apple has ever made and that has actually served me the best in terms of a huge impact, a, a truly meaningful difference to my workflow with things running so much faster. I'm shocked, honestly, that it took this long for Apple to get this done, but you know, computers are incredibly complicated and switching entire architectures from Intel to their own chips uh, was obviously a huge undertaking, but I've been incredibly happy with this machine. As much money as you can possibly spend to spec one out, I would definitely do it. Uh, so before owning this, I came from using a uh, two computer setup. One was a 13 inch MacBook Pro, fully spec'd from like 2017, and paired with my iMac Pro, which was not fully spec'd, but incredibly well built. So since switching to this setup, uh, I am using just the one machine, and I pair this when I'm working at my desk with the Apple Pro Display X and I have the version with like the matte finish, whatever they call it, the nano, diamond etched nano coating. I absolutely love that display. It probably warrants a dedicated review just on its own in terms of how well I think it's suited specifically for a photographer's use. It's a lot of money. I don't know that the display itself uh, it can be justified with that cost, but the MacBook, which I spent about $6,000 on, is absolutely worth the money. Um, these are the exact configuration details of my machine. I went for the 14 inch because I figured I want maximum portability if I'm taking this around when I'm traveling or editing from my couch or you know an airplane or something. Once you get to the 16 inch size, it gets a little cramped in most places with the larger size display. That's just my personal preference. Um, and I knew I was gonna have a huge 32 inch display to work from when I'm at home where I care a little less about portability and I just really wanna maximize uh, screen real estate. So for me, the 14 inch uh, was the best overall fit. Uh, I fully maxed out the, the CPU with 10 cores, 32 core GPU and a 16 core neural engine. All the Thunderbolt ports they offered, Thunderbolt 4, they offer three of them, uh, which work fantastically. And yes, I've been using the SD card constantly, all the time. I'm so glad that is back in a pro machine. Additionally, I got 64 gigabytes of unified memory, which is their RAM, I guess. Honestly, my money was best spent is with hard drive storage. Eight terabytes of SSD storage has absolutely changed my life. This is me talking uh, specifically as a photographer. If I was a videographer and I knew without a doubt within a single year or season of shooting, I was definitely gonna breach eight terabytes of content, like pure footage generation, which I would imagine uh, many videographers actually do. Um, this may not make as big a difference, but for me as a still photographer, as long as I'm not falling like many, many months behind in delivering my full client galleries, I save and keep all my raw files locally to my internal hard drive with of course backups on some external drives. Uh, but the, the ones that I'm actually working from, I do save internally and I've not even come close to filling up eight terabytes. Actually, so I have hit about half though. So four terabytes is about average where my hard drive space is. It looks like um, if you account for all my raw files and all my audio samples, like drum samples and, and various audio files from Logic Pro, uh, those take up a lot of space. And everything else that I have on my machine, uh, I still have 3.64 terabytes available to add whatever I want. So that is a ton of headroom. But unfortunately, the next step down from their eight terabyte option is four terabytes. So cutting my space in half, I actually, and using the computer as I've been comfortably using it uh, without even having to think about space for the last four months, if I had opted for the four terabyte half size drive, 
which is also significantly cheaper, about half the price. In the last month or so, I would have had to start playing that super annoying, really stressful game of copying files back and forth. Potentially undelivered working client files on an external drive that I had to remember to bring with me, and then also keep a second copy of that somewhere else and make sure that that's updated. I hate, I just cannot stand the process of having to shuffle files around because the internal storage space on my machine is filling up. And segueing that into the overall performance of this machine, I can honestly say most of the time, nine times out of 10, when photographers ask me to look at their computer and, and figure out why things might be running a little bit slowly, it's because they are, their hard drives, their internal drive where their OS is operating from is like 90% full. And when you're just looking at your machine and not doing that much, it seems like you can get away with that. You got lots of headroom to download files and open them. But once you actually start working in really memory intensive apps like Photoshop or uh, potentially Lightroom and other applications, especially video and audio related, cache files start to build up and they don't always purge when you think they're gonna purge. So that extra 10% of headroom can fill up in no time. And oftentimes it happens at the least convenient moment, right when you need to import a really critical client shoot that you have to turn around super fast. But you're held back by having to copy uh, older shoots off your machine or something like that. So I can say without a doubt, the best money I spent on this, if I had to uh, budget a little bit more and scale back one of the other options, uh, I would keep the eight terabyte SSD drive as primary, this is where I wanna spend my money. That might be a little counterintuitive to how a lot of people think about machines and processors, but honestly, even the base level Apple M1 CPU, which is like just the M1 Pro, I think, is more than fast enough to do pretty much anything you're gonna need uh, with photography and, and, and even videography related editing. You know, unless you're doing like crazy 4K RAW, 6K, 8K, like really high resolution footage, you're gonna be totally fine with the, the cheaper, slower CPU for what you're doing. Now, I definitely haven't done extensive tests at all uh, as, with video, with really, really high resolution video or anything like that. So take my opinion coming from the perspective of a still photographer, primarily. Now, there is another catch, another thing to think about. If you do what I recommend and keep your raw files on your internal hard drive, and edit from those as like your main working files, always, you should always keep a backup in an external drive, right? That would mean you need to plug into an external hard drive every time you import so that you're getting a real-time copy, uh, which is kind of hard to remember. I think a lot of photographers might actually forget and not be very disciplined about keeping up with that. But that's where having an external monitor has also proven a lot of its value. I generally gravitate every few days or pretty much every day toward working from that big, beautiful display for a few hours or longer. Um, and oftentimes keeping my laptop plugged into that display overnight. So without having to think about it as, a, as an on purpose, okay, I gotta plug this in to make sure my files are being backed up. I'm doing that anyway, because I wanna dock my laptop on my desk have my external hard drives plugged in and use the big monitor as sort of my default state. Even if you don't have the budget or don't care about owning uh, the best XDR, you know, pro display that Apple offers, which would be totally understandable. It's like $5,000 or something like that. Although I got a really good deal on a used one. Um, I would still highly recommend buying a cheaper, you know, $800, $1,000 monitor, just so you're generally compelled to wanna plug it in and mount your machine. And then not only use it as a larger monitor that's more comfortable to edit from occasionally, but also have just a regular reason to be plugged in, fully charge your battery and have your files backed up. The main piece of software that I use to automate my, um, backups, it automatically monitors specific folders that I've targeted. And if there's any changes at all to those folders, it copies those new changes to my external drives in a predefined location. Automatically, it's called Carbon Copy Cloner. So every time I plug in and it detects a predetermined uh, external hard drive that I normally have, uh, it automatically monitors my pictures folder any new raw files, it shoots over there, and it lets me know if there's been any errors in copying. So I highly recommend Carbon Copy Cloner. Uh, I do wish this was something that was built into some other apps that I use, like Aftershoot or Lightroom or some other things, but uh, Carbon Copy Cloner is sort of the best that I've found. Briefly going over a couple other tools that I use to just keep things running super fast and know in the moment if something is taking up more resources than I realize. Number one is using this app called Disk Daisy. There's a couple different pieces of software that do a really good job uh, with visualizing chunks of data on your hard drive, but I love Disk Daisy. It's incredibly fast. All you need to do is select your main folder or 
uh, source hard drive or whatever you want. It takes a few minutes to churn through everything and then uh, breaks it out into this kind of cool Death Star <laughs> pie chart looking thing. You can click in through here and see about uh, maybe a couple gigabytes here of smaller objects, hidden things that maybe are in the trash can that you haven't purged yet. You can go in and look at your user. So here's my username. I am the Sam. By far, most things seem to be stored on my desktop. That makes sense because my 2021 Lightroom catalog is on my desktop. Uh, and that is humongous. That's 1.5 terabytes. Uh, I use one Lightroom catalog per year. I always have, as long as you know how to manage your Lightroom catalog, it should run perfectly fast, even with all that. Looks like though I have 1.1 terabytes of previews. I can probably purge those and save some space if I absolutely needed to. That's a huge amount of previews. And most of those are probably from the first eight months uh, of the year that I don't instantly need to look at uh, right now. But really this is just to show you sort of at a glance how Disk Daisy represents all of your various chunks of data and files visually. So it makes it super easy to find something that either filled up accidentally that you didn't realize or maybe completely forgot about and no longer need. If you're bumping up against uh, limited hard drive space, download Disk Daisy, absolutely try it. Say, okay, there's a couple different ways to delete stuff, but I'll just delete something. I'll just delete something I know I don't need anymore. Here's a random raw file. So you can actually right click on this and then preview it to see it, like kind of what it might look like. Uh, you can see it in Finder. You can move it to uh, an overall collector or you can click and drag it down here to the collector. And without having deleted anything yet, you can kind of go through and literally collect bits of what you want, then hit delete and it will purge the stuff forever directly from Disk Daisy. So pretty awesome. I highly recommend it. I, I find myself wanting to open this up you know, every few weeks just to keep an eye on things and make sure nothing, uh, you know, like especially a cache file, ballooned up larger than uh, I realized. Software bit number two is called iStatistica Pro. You can find this in the Mac App Store. Looks a little complicated if you don't know that much about computers, but even at its most basic level, it gives you a really clean readout of the battery life. It will also populate your mouse and keyboard and other Bluetooth peripherals, which I really love kind of seeing at a glance. Uh, it gives you a sense of what apps are using the most memory in terms of RAM space and then also virtual memory. Um, it's kind of surprising to see that PickTime uploader is using as much space as it is because I don't think I'm actually uploading anything right now. So certain insights like that, you know, if you know, for example, you're not using the PickTime uploader, I, I can quit that if my computer's running a little bit slow and I, I just want to free up some RAM and you can see I just quit that and it's instantly reflected in the memory usage here. So this app is just super helpful for an at a glance kind of pulse <laughs> readout of everything that's happening. If you think every single app is closed that might be slowing your machine down, open this and, and just literally take a look at both the memory section. That's where I would primary start is just see what's taking up the most memory and then just close through them one by one until you see which app is being is the culprit. Uh, and then second, after that, I would look at the at actual processor function. Uh, I don't have anything super intense running right now, uh, but this is, looks like actually my screen capture is the number one thing. I'm recording my, my screen for this video. That's the number one thing that's taking up resources, which totally makes sense. Uh, and the computer still seems to be running fine. You can take a peek at your graphics processor and your overall network uh, usage. So this kind of has everything. It also has these other tabs uh, here that give you a little bit more of that visual breakdown. So if you're more visually inclined, maybe pop over there. It also has its own version of visualizing data on your hard drive. So if you do want to save money, you can pass on Disk Daisy and just use iStatistica Pro um, to visualize your data, but I still prefer Disk Daisy. I think it's faster and just an, a cleaner interface. Uh, the last app I want to talk about uh, is again, sort of a storage space optimizer. It's called Rosy. And I actually did a full length review of this app back when it was called Dot Photon Raw. Yeah, I think that's what it used to be called years ago, like 2018. Um, that review's on my Patreon. It, they have updated and made a ton of changes to that interface, not just with their name and their branding, but the actual speed and methods that they use to compress things. But so what Rosy does is compress any raw file uh, using a proprietary algorithm that has no visual discernible difference at all 
from my eye at least, uh, between the original source raw file. It will compress it and convert it into an industry standard uh, DNG file. So it keeps it as technically a raw file that you can edit, but with like half the file size of your original capture. So you don't lose any resolution at all. It does do something in their proprietary algorithm to compress some of the dynamic range and some of the color. And in doing an AB comparison between a fully edited non raw file and a fully edited Rosy compressed file, I've, I literally can't tell the difference. So if you just can't justify spending $2,000 on just an eight terabyte internal hard drive, which is totally understandable, and you have to go with the four terabyte option, I really wish there was a six. I think six would be sort of the sweet spot, but there's not. Let me just double check, but I'm pretty sure there's no six terabyte option. Nope, sadly it jumps from one to two to four to eight. <laughs> Uh, but if you just can't justify the $2,200 for the eight terabyte, go with the four terabyte and then leverage a tool like Rosy to compress your raw files and save on your internal hard drive space. I promise you won't even know the difference. The downside is, you know, take some time to, to actually let it do its thing and run through uh, every single raw file. You can also use something like JPEG Mini Pro, which I really love, but I hardly ever have huge numbers of JPEGs on my computer. I generally go from raw file directly to PickTime, which is my client gallery host, and I don't have original copies of all my JPEGs always on my hard drives. Um, I get a ton of questions in general about how to make Lightroom run fast and efficiently. I have an entire separate like step-by-step -step post. You can see, I'll link it in this video. Um, it is on my Patreon feed and it has served literally thousands of photographers. I hope you've enjoyed this follow-up review. Uh, check out my article. I go over a lot of the other features like the audio and the battery life performance and all that in my actual article, which I'll also link in this video. Love to hear from any of you. If you've, if you've purchased one of the new MacBook and if you've had a similar experience to me. Hopefully you have. I found it well worth the money. As always, thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. And I'll be back soon. Bye everyone.